Hi, I'm Marin Somerset, web editor in chief of Money Week magazine. I have with me today Douglas Carswell, Britain's only UKIP MP, and we are sitting down today at a very exciting time. It looks like we may be getting uh, to a crucial point in the development of the European Union. Greece has just voted against uh, the deal they've been offered by the rest of Europe, against austerity and perhaps for democracy. Uh, now, Douglas, I know you have strong views on this. Where, where, where do you feel this is taking us? Uh, I think the Greeks have voted the right way. Um, there are no easy options for them, but I think they've done the sensible thing, or rather they've done the least worst thing. It was a choice between, in effect, um, paying back a debt that cannot be paid back, or doing the alternative, which is to default on the debt, decouple from the euro, devalue, and allow that reshuffling of the economic pact uh, economic pack that, 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 that Greece desperately needs but to do. But do you think this necessarily means decoupling from the euro? I mean, it's possible to default, which at this point is, yeah. is inevitable, really. Yeah. It's possible to default well, and stay inside uh, the euro. Th th I th they have to default simply because at the moment, contrary to what uh, pundits in this country say, Greece actually has a, a primary budget surplus. Mm. Greece's primary budget surplus is healthier today than the British one. Um, the problem is, of course, they've got to pay all that interest back. Now, Imagine if an individual got themselves into such a hideous position with debt that they couldn't possibly pay back their debts. Civilized societies have always allowed, uh, when a person gets into such debt that they can't pay it back, they've always allowed them to start over, to start again. Yeah. And I would actually say that one of the great advances in the uh, creation of, of civilized society is precisely that, debt, debt forgiveness. If someone gets into such a hideous position, instead of them becoming, in effect, a slave of their creditors, they, they, it, it becomes the creditor's problem. Um, if that's good for people, it's got to be good for countries. Ultimately, it's the fault of the people who lent Greece the money, I'm afraid. Well, that's a key point, isn't it? I mean, you could say that these loans were outrageous in the first place, and, and mm. particularly the way they've been restructured over the last few yep. years, in that the, uh, the lenders knew full well, and still mm. know full well, there mm. is no way on earth yep. that Greece yep. could ever conceivably <laughs> repay these so loans. So does it make the loans fraudulent in the first place? Well, if I was a Greek, sorry, if I was a German taxpayer, I would be absolutely livid, because the bailouts that we've had have not only increased the size of the Greek debt, the bailouts actually did something really quite sinister. They transferred the losses, the debt losses of private banking institutions onto the balance sheet of public authorities in Europe. Now, I'm, I'm pretty pro the free market, but that sort of behaviour is pretty disgusting. It gives capitalism a bad name. In fact, it, 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 it makes the slightly more um, loony, lefty uh, conspiracy theorists actually sound <laughs> sound pretty spot on. Yeah. The transfer of that debt liability from the private sector to the public has not only saved foolish bankers from the consequences of their own investment stupidity, it's actually left the German taxpayer with huge liabilities. So I think the German taxpayer has a right to be pretty cross, but cross not just with the Greek government, cross with the behaviour of their own government that has allowed that transfer of debt liability to take place under the guise of supposed European solidarity. It's actually been a form of theft. One of the ways you could see what's happening in Europe at the moment is to say that, well, we might disapprove of the way the Greek government approaches what they're trying to do. It nonetheless represents a, you know, a resurgence of democracy and a reminder mm. that while the European Union might, might have attempted to be a great political project that brings everybody yep. together, everyone's cultures yep. remain what they are, yep. and each state still has a, a sovereign democracy inside it. Yep. And when they clash, which yep. they currently are, it's very difficult to get yep. out of inside this kind of structure. I mean, I was going to say, I think this is a wake-up call for the those who believe in the, the organising the affairs of, of Europeans by, by grand design, um, by you know Project EU, um, I think it's more than it's more than a wake up call. It's uh, surely it's game over. Mm. Um, you know they they created a monetary union in the belief that eventually people would get used to the idea of abiding by these collective rules. What we've seen in Greece is that actually, you know. What about the people? The political elites in Athens who were voted out of office might have gone along with this, but they didn't bring the people with them. Mm -hmm. now, let's remember that Greece received huge amounts of uh, subsidy in the 80s and the 90s, according to the, sort of the, the Jean Monnet, Jacques Delors project, um, which, which used this sort of form of, 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 of bung and bribery. Uh, according to that, the Greeks should have been the most grateful of, of Euro citizens. And we see by a massive majority, actually, they, they reject this idea. Uh, I suspect, though, that the idea of 
monetary union, for all the reasons that the, the skeptics said, is, is unworkable. Mm. You, you, in order to have a monetary union, you need to have um, the cycles of output uh, uh, within different economies need to be relatively converged. Think of interest rates and monetary policy as a sort of a gear lever. If you were driving cars around a racetrack at different speeds, uh, you, you would need to adjust the gear accordingly. You need a different monetary policy, a, a different gear in Greece compared to Germany, compared to France, compared to Italy. By having a standardized set of interest rates across Europe, you've not just created the Greek situation. You know, look at Italy. Italy's actually got some fantastic first-class, medium-sized businesses with absolute world-class brands, uh, but there's been no increase in GDP because they've got a totally inappropriate monetary policy. Um, well, they've got we the wrong interest rate and effectively the wrong exchange rate as, as well. I mean, Germany, Germany has an exchange rate that is very low uh, mm -hmm. for what it would be were it were it uh, standing alone currency Exports wise. Exports are doing and, uh, pretty well. Well, absolutely, yeah. and there's a reason for yeah. that. There's a reason why there are Daimler buses all over the streets in Athens, yeah. right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, but it's an unsustainable model because if you have a, a fixed exchange rate, a sort of ERM Mark II, which basically makes German exports more competitive to Europe but bought on IOUs, you know, work it out. It's not sustainable yeah. and it's not going to, things that can't last don't. Um, I don't think it's particularly good actually ultimately for, for Germany either. Um, you know, when, when the whole idea of a single currency was, was first mooted, um, it was seen as being modern. It was seen as being the way forward. People who were opposed to it, people like myself who argued against it, I was working in fund management at the time uh, that the euro was introduced, and I, I, I you know, was encouraged to keep my views to myself. But, um, you know, I wonder actually if we've got this entirely the wrong way around. Maybe given the way that the world is, is going, the future lies in not creating a single currency in lots of different countries, but having multiple currencies in every currency. I suspect the future actually lies in currency competition. In uh, different currencies in each country or different, different currencies between countries, or do you mean having different currencies inside each country? M online, you can, you can, yeah. you know, I, I, I just came here by underground and mm -hmm. I was standing in Westminster Tube Station and there were people not just buying tickets, but actually getting ready to get on buses using digital payment without even having to change um, the original currency. It's so seamless now. Why, why do we have this idea um, that, you know, well, 40 years ago, if we had been having this conversation, everyone would have agreed you had to have a national airline, mm -hmm. and that national airline should have preferential treatment, state favours. Maybe, maybe in 40 years' time, we'll look back and say, wasn't it odd that we thought you had to use a particular currency? Now, I'm not suggesting we don't maintain our own currency. Of course we should. Um, we, we need to keep the pound. But fundamentally, in a free society, if people in London want to conduct business in and sign contracts in, 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 in multiple currencies, why shouldn't they? I introduced a bill in Parliament, actually, to suggest that actually legal tender, which is the uh, currency in which uh, debts to government should be paid, we, we should accept a multiplicity of currencies now. Wouldn't that be an admin nightmare? Um, in the exchange rates moving around the place constantly how do you how do you keep your pricing going in a shop you, well, if people are using several different currencies well, to pay people do it all the time people go into shops all the time and pay using a card that you know from that a bank account that may de denote it in all sorts of currencies so actually digital solves out the admin problem um the the you know the the the, the real thing is let's not have grand monetary plans let's just let technology and the free market shape the monetary world of the future what we see in europe is a consequence of trying to do money by by design by fiat um perhaps um that's the problem now i'm guessing that uh, central banks wouldn't be that keen on this idea generally officials who are in charge of things like to keep in control of those things but you know look at Look what happened in, in Zimbabwe. No one said, you know, the dollar, the US dollar is going to be the currency. It's just that official policy was so disastrous, it ended up being um, the dollar, to some extent, the South African rand. I, I, and then, I, of course, we have several countries in, uh, uh, knocking around Europe who mm. use the euro, even though it's not their official Absolutely. country, Montenegro, etc. And I, I suspect in 10 years' time, if you were on a holiday in Greece, people would probably take euros, but they'd probably take a multiplicity of currencies too. Um, you know, 
maybe that's that's the way forward for for Greece, not so much to leave the eurozone, but just to do what I think they ought to do, which is to to, to accept that um, one size does not fit all. Okay. There are implications for our own country in this, of course, because um, you know if um, if we were to have a period, and we haven't for a long time, but if we were to have a period of high inflation in this country, if there were too many British pounds chasing too few goods in the UK, um, in the old days, under that scenario, rich people would have protected their wealth by um, buying assets or, or moving their money overseas. In the age of the internet, all sorts of people would be able to transfer their currency from one currency denominator account to another. So I, I, I suspect that actually currency competition is one of those things that's just going to happen and, and it, it doesn't really doesn't really depend on what central banks think. It's just it's it's going to happen. Okay, interesting. Now in the in the shorter term I think you're expecting Brexit, aren't you? You're yeah. expecting Greece to leave. Yeah. Uh, you're the, are you then concerned that uh, a, there might be a period of social unrest, or B, mm. that then Italy and Spain will quickly follow. Well, I know you think that that's the right result, but of course it comes yeah. with, with imagine a scenario. Imagine a scenario where Greece defaulted on the debts, which I think we all agree mathematically has to happen, but stayed in the euro. Now, mm -hmm. I think that would probably be an even more catastrophic scenario for the euro, because if you were Portuguese or Spanish or Italian, and um, you know you saw this country that had the advantages so called, of being in the single currency, but didn't have to pay its debts, well. What, what about what about you? You would start to say, so you know. I suspect that for that reason, um, leaving leaving the euro is going to be foisted upon Greece. When that happens, but uh, if we take a step back there. How can the European Union force Greece out of the euro? There's a, there's no legal basis for that. Is yeah, there? I mean, I mean, these yeah, things I, like I, this, I, I the imagine, legal yeah, the legalities yeah, here are when fascinating. The, when, you when, can't when, make someone leave when, if there's no yeah, exit route. Yeah. When when they created this this this. Um, monetary uh, monster. They 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 didn't think these things through. But you know, fundamentally, um, look at it this way: unless the ECB continues to extend cash to Greek banks, people in Greece are going to have to transact business, mm. and IOUs are going to start to be used. Um, you know, quite how it unwinds, who knows? But mm. I think it will unwind. But you know. I don't think it will stop at Greece. I mean, I think the really interesting question is, can France remain in the euro? Mm -hmm. um, look at the debt to GDP ratios in France. Um, I, I, I suspect that um, it's a slightly longer term issue, but I, I, I'm not convinced that France can remain in a monetary union with, um, with Germany and Austria. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, interesting how much more conciliatory France is being towards, uh, towards Greece than, than Germany. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for for a generation or more, France has gone along with with um, um, these ideas of, of European integration and, and, and monetary union um, in the belief that it can somehow establish and, and, and retain uh, political control in excess of its economic muscle. And you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that that's, that's going to last. Mm. And are you concerned? I mean, I'm beginning to be concerned that all of this results in, uh, you know, proper social unrest. Yeah. You know, the breakup of a monetary union like mm. this. I mean, let's let's say it does happen. I mean, I mm. like you. I think that the odds of a Greek exit are now very high, mm. and obviously there's already severe social pain yeah. in yeah. in yeah. Greece. And yeah. if the monetary union mm. does fracture. Mm. Yeah all over as yeah. a result. It, it, yeah. it, could it could be, be horrible. It could be really horrible. And yeah. this is why I don't think anyone should be celebrating. Um, and I don't think anyone should be, should be, you know, Eurosceptics like me should be very, very careful not to, to celebrate. This is a, about the least worst option, and Greece mm -hmm. has taken the least worst option. It could be rather like Russia after Russia defaulted in the late 90s, or after Argentina defaulted in the, late, the early noughties, which would be awful, painful, but no serious social breakdown. But it could be worse than that because all modern economies require specialization in exchange mm. uh, to, to, to survive and, and to prosper. Fuel, vegetables, medical products, we, 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 we need free trade. And I'm not sure a society that was unable to specialize in exchange and, and conduct free trade would be a particularly nice place after not just months but within 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 a matter of days mm -hmm. so I, I think we do need to prepare for that having said that if if I was in charge of British policy towards these things and I'm not but if I was if Greece was to default 
and if Greece was to leave the euro, that's when I think it would be right for the British government to begin to offer um, significant help if necessary. Humanitarian assistance. You mean and, and, and help. Monetary, assistance. monetary assistance. Imagine a situation in which Greece created a new drachma, it mm -hmm. devalued by 40-50%. Perhaps you might see, you know, Anglosphere countries um, coming together and saying, you know, we will hold a certain percentage of our foreign exchange reserves in this new currency, or that might be one way to do it. Another might be doing doing it through the vehicle of the IMF. Mm -hmm. Although I think maybe one or two European board members of the IMF uh, should perhaps uh, uh, be replaced because yeah, they. I think maybe we don't have the confidence in the IMF yeah. to help us out with yeah. this one anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. But but you know, it's often been said that Europe creates these uh, problems for itself by imposing isms and the Anglosphere then comes to the rescue. Perhaps this might happen. Perhaps you might see the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, India, having to sit around a table and say, OK, um, let's, let's give some ballast to a new Greek currency and let's help Greece out. The point is, it would be worth our spending, and it pains me to say this, but it would be worth our spending billions of pounds to fix the problem. But the bailouts up until now have made the problem worse. Mm -hmm. So we should only be putting our money on the table to help Greece if that involves some sort of devaluation. Because mm -hmm. And we want to help that. Greece for humanitarian reasons, Absolutely. but we also want to help Greece for geopolitical reasons, right? I mean, it's a very yeah, strategic I'm, position, Greece. It is, but the Greeks are our allies. And you know, we, we helped Greece um, in its struggle for independence 200 years ago. Um, and it's absolutely right that, that, that we, we should want to help Greece. I've, I've argued against us supporting bailouts because I believe bailouts make things worse. But mm. if Greece is going to, if Greece is going to uh, be um, independent in monetary terms, it's absolutely right and proper that alongside um, the United States and others, we 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 do what we can. You know, Greece is part of the West, mm. and we need to do everything we can to support a NATO ally. Okay, well, speaking of the West, let's bring this back to the UK. Um, George Osborne seems to be moving in quite a few directions that I think you would approve of, for example, with welfare reform. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see what he says tomorrow. Um, you know, Greece, I think, is the first Western country to discover that you can't live forever beyond your means, mm -hmm. and no amount of votes in a legislature or a referendum can change the laws of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Greece is not going to be the last country to discover that. We need to live within our means, and we need to live within our tax base. Um, over the past generation, successive British governments, I think I'm right in saying over the past 36 years, we've only had a budget surplus in six of them. <laughs> it's yes, terrifying. It doesn't happen often. Yeah. We've doubled the national debt in, in, in six or seven years. Yeah. Well, we, we found that we can collect in taxes about 36, 36 37% of GDP, yeah. and we pretty much always spend more of it. But we use inflation tax and borrowing um, to make up the difference, and you can't do that indefinitely. I mean, the, you know, there are all sorts of states and powers in history that tried to, but you, you, you can't. You need to live within your means. And what are the, let's say, what are the, the three, <coughs> three or four major things that, that you would do to help us live, live within our means? I know you think there are various government departments we could happily live without, mm. for example. We simply just don't need as many civil servants as we have. Um, I'm not just talking about scrapping whole departments, but you know, do we need a Department of Culture, Media and Sport? Um, no, I'd say um, some of its functions could be moved to the Home Office and the rest should be wound up. Do we need a Department for International Aid? Um, even if um, you believe we should be spending the amount of aid that we are spending, and I don't, um, I think it would be wiser if that department was actually part of the Foreign Office, because I, I do think actually our aid budget should be synced to the Foreign Office. Mm -hmm. um, we could make do with far, far fewer uh, civil servants. Um, I think another thing we, we need to do in order to live within our means is, is look seriously at um, certain areas of, of welfare spending. I'm not talking about uh, pensions, I'm not talking about um, certain benefits that are paid to people who've spent all their lives contributing into the system, um, although perhaps we might uh, at some point um, make it clear if, if, if a, some future government was to, to, to want to start means testing, <laughs> now might be the time to, to let people in their 40s and their no, 50s know that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't support doing that now. Uh, but I think there are some areas where, you know, the housing benefit bill, the housing benefit bill, you know, there was this great talk about um, the benefit cap. And everyone said, what a wonderful thing it is. But you know, £26,000 a year, very few people have actually been affected by it. And I'm afraid, I think, we need to get serious about reducing 
the housing benefit bill. The housing benefit bill, once you start to distort the pricing mechanism, you create unintended consequences and you actually use state subsidy to push up rents and you create this vicious circle of spiraling rents which actually doesn't increase the number of rental properties available. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that, that that's yeah. a serious I mean, our problem. problem in the UK, housing is, is a huge part of mm. all our problems because we've put in mm. place policies which have uh, mm. pushed up house prices in general, which, made it, mm. which have given us more people who need to be tenants and yep. then our yep. housing benefit system has yep. pushed up rents and yep. the whole thing just sort of cycles yep. on and on yep. and on in yep. a horribly, horribly different yep. Way. One thing I'm commissioning some serious research on um, as, as UKIP, and I, I don't have the answers now, but I, I, I want to have some empirical analysis of the issue, is the impact of, of in-work benefits. In-work benefits were brought in by Gordon Brown for, for good reasons. There were people on, on very low incomes who, who needed support. Uh, unfortunately, though, if you, if you pay people to do low paid work, you get more people in low paid work. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect a big corporate interest, big business, quite likes this because it's a state subsidy for them to pay ridiculously low wages. Look at the argument that we're having at the moment as to whether or not you should pay the living wage. Um, I would love it if everyone was on the living wage, but I suspect one of the reasons why it's necessary to insist upon paying the living wage is precisely because the in-work benefit system incentivizes employers to not pay people properly. I wonder well, because people end up with the same income regardless. Mm. I mean, the employer will yeah. pay them a living wage, but, but, but nonetheless, the yeah. benefit system will yeah. still top them up yeah. to, to a reasonable but level. It's, I just wonder if big business and big corporate interests have created a whole raft of jobs that only exist because the big corporate interest knows that the taxpayer's going to mm. top things up. Well, and we also wonder if it isn't the case that um, the uh, the tax credit system also incentivizes people to work part time mm -hmm. uh, because if you work you know depending on whether you're in a couple or whether you're single it's twelve yeah, or sixteen no, no, hours yeah. and if you work that number of hours then you click into the mm. whole yeah. tax credit yeah. system yeah. which incentivizes people yeah. to work part time yeah. which obviously has a roll on effect yeah. onto productivity yeah. yes indeed and the productivity puzzle I suspect cannot you know I was listening to a discussion about the productivity puzzle recently and they're talking about airports now. I'm all in favour of air travel, it's a wonderful thing, but I don't think productivity is necessarily much higher within 10 miles of Heathrow compared to 100 miles away from Heathrow. <laughs> you know, we're not going to solve the productivity puzzle by building more airports, although important though that may be. Now, I, I suspect you can't really understand the productivity puzzle without doing some serious empirical research on the impact of in-work benefits, and that's Unfortunately, none of the established parties have done this. Obviously, the Labour Party doesn't want to do it because mm. it doesn't want to undermine the great legacy of, 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 of Gordon Brown. Uh, I say that with a straight face. Um, and the Conservative Party hasn't done the thinking on this, well, basically because it's, it's never been able to create a compelling post-Thatcher um, agenda to anything. Um, this is where I think UKIP could come in with a proper analysis of the impact of in-work benefits. Yeah, I, I come from a constituency where in work benefits are enormously important to people. And I don't want to see people make decisions that are going to have big impacts on people without thinking through the consequences. I think we've got to make sure that we make decisions in order to make it possible for people to to get the most out of life. Well, and we I'm want to sure incentivize them for look, to look for well paid full time work, yep. not badly paid yep. short uh, yep. part time work, yep. right? And, and you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a growing economy, the norm would be that you have incentives to, to automate. You have incentives to, I, I was reading a, a paper on 19th century um, American history, and um, um, one of the reasons why uh, America mechanized was because at times there were shortages of, of labor. And it, 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 the market's very clever. When it's got a shortage of people with skills, it, it, it responds by putting capital and invention into finding neat solutions to these problems. I, I suspect that actually the in-work benefit system means that the UK economy is now less well positioned to create wealth in the 21st century. Yeah. Well, we haven't been incentivized to, as you say, to automate, to find Absol more efficient ways Absol of doing things Absol because we're having cheap labor paid Absol for by the state. You say these things far more articulate than me. That's the point I've been trying to make. Are there any other big policy areas in, in the UK that you think you have a slightly different take on? To Energy. Financially. Energy. Um, mm. The Tweedledee Tweedledum parties are signed up to this idea of renewable targets. Mm -hmm. 
It well, there actually, the, the Conservatives are rowing back on that a little, right? There's a lot of talk about ending subsidies. Earlier I don't think than we before, need a rowing boat. I think we need <laughs> we need we need a turbocharged. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's it's a fundamental problem to wealth creation in this country. Look at the United States. Um, energy costs are so much lower there, and capital and technology have come together wonderfully to create extraordinary solutions to the energy problems they face. So much so that actually the United States is kind of re-industrializing. I heard that sort of uh, aluminium, aluminum, I think they call them smelters, um, and, 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 and fertilizer factories are reopening in the United yeah. States. Yeah. Um, Thanks I'm to not, cheap energy. Th I'm not sure that the laws of physics are different in Lancashire, but last week we heard that, um, you know, um, the, the the local council rejected the one scheme that we we have. You know, know how is hypermobile? How can it possibly be that we're so far behind Pennsylvania? <laughs> you know, yeah. And of course, it's been rejected in Scotland as well, hasn't it? Or certainly put on hold. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so I I I think that we need to look at energy policy. I'm I'm coming to the view that we should love the technology, love new technology, mm -hmm. but always be against the subsidy and I would extend that principle right across energy. Um, if, the new talk, now, if the new technology is good enough it'll find its own way, you mean it doesn't absolutely. require the subsidy? I, I suspect in 20, 30 years, Marin, every house in this country, every window in this country, every car in this country will come with solar panelling fitted and it will be s fitted in such a way that you won't even notice it. Um, I suspect many homes around the country will have a battery under the stairs that is so hyper-efficient. Um, in fact, the technology is already there. It's so hyper-efficient that they recharge on gorgeous days like this, and um, it, it will power your fridge and your washing machine at, at, at night. Um, and you know, I, I suspect that will become a norm, but I don't think you need subsidies to do that. I suspect that wind turbines <laughs> are never going to become uh, sustainable without subsidies, and I, I'm... It, it doesn't really hurt me at all to say it, but I imagine that the countryside will be relatively wind turbine free in 30 years, just as our inner cities are becoming tower block free because we realised actually it was a public policy mistake. Yeah, that relies on the idea that someone's going to pay to take things down. <laughs> <Well> <laughs> I don't know who yeah. that's going to be. <laughs> but, you know, if, if both the established parties are wedded to this idea of ministers being able in their wisdom to decide what the correct energy mix is and that's basically the conceit of the political class they they believe that they can choose the correct energy mix um, I think the scope for uh, my party to come up with a a very pro technology um, very free market alternative that will give us cheap energy and and be credible mm. now you talk about my party uh, but there is only one of you at the moment. <laughs> when I said uh, my party, so I, I didn't mean that in a possessive way. I'm, yes, I'm so one of 50,000 members. Of course. But uh, are there <coughs> enough people listening? To you, you have uh, interesting ideas on welfare, interesting ideas on the way currency should work, interesting ideas on monetary policy, on energy, etc. But are people still listening? I think so, absolutely. Um, there was, I think during the, the election, uh, a, a remarkable achievement from my party in producing a manifesto and a manifesto that was not just easily the best manifesto that EGOT's produced. I actually think it, 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 it easily trumps what Tweedledee and Tweedledum parties um, produced. It was thoughtful, it was coherent, it was free market um, and it was sensible. Um, and um, our policies on Europe and immigration, which are very important, mm -hmm. were, were, were chapters in a, a, a fairly extensive um, publication. We we need to to build on that, and um, I. You know, UKIP is clearly the, the the third party. We got four million votes. The Labour Party uh, got um, nine and a half million. Mm -hmm. um, we are behind the Labour Party in a, a lot of seats. We came second in 120 seats. I think we are very well placed. To, to displace the Labour Party. Let me ask you one, one more question on this. We, we talked earlier about uh, the resurgence of democracy in, in Europe. Um, there's a problem with democracy, isn't there, which is that um, so many of the problems that we have as a society, particularly as a Western society, so, you know, demography, education, etc., are quite long-term problems. Mm -hmm. But our governments change every four years. Do you think there's an, an argument for 
given the stage of development that we're at and the, st the demographic stage we're at for extending the term of a government out to Absolutely say not. eight Absolutely. nine years or Absolutely. so. No. Your question with respect rests on a conceit which is that solutions to our challenges are best engineered by, by design, by blueprint. If it was the case that the best way to fix the challenges we face was by blueprint, mm -hmm. then yes, it would make sense to give the planners time to develop their grand schemes. But actually, no. I've been reading an early copy of Matt Ridley's amazing book, The Evolution of Everything, mm -hmm. and it, it, it argues actually on the contrary. Complex systems are best created, I was going to say engineered, but created, evolved, um, by trial and error. Um, and that suggests to me that you, you shouldn't give big space and time to, to grand planners. If you want to create sophisticated public policy solutions to energy, to welfare, to trade, actually the answer is to allow uh, the grand planners less scope and to allow innovation and trial and error. That's how to evolve the right so public policy solutions. Down to a year. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say this. The Chartists mm. argued for a whole range of things, and the one area that they didn't, haven't yet got is, is annual parliaments. And I don't think they will ever get annual parliaments, but I think direct democracy means that actually you will, have, you will no longer have a system where the, the, the voter contracts out to a priesthood of politicians to run things for, in those days it was seven years, it's now five years. Um, it will be a, a constant conversation between govern and governing, um, and it will be a, a, a two-way conversation. Um, you know, if if you were to argue, as some people do, you know, you go along to the you know the 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 the, um, the Pooh Bar's favourite think tank, you know, the Institute for Government. You know, they'll say that you know actually we need long-term plans. We need you know um, independent bodies like the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, mm -hmm. to to. to um, devise solutions to energy and you know, nonsense, absolute nonsense. The way to find complex answers is through constant innovation and change. Um, if you put um, mandarins in charge of things, they, they wreck a country as the Ming Chinese discovered and as Europe is discovering under the rule of the Brussels mandarin. Douglas, thank you very much. Thank you. You told me five years ago, if you told me that the, the half the world would be in negative interest rates or something like that, I'd say, well, that'll, that'll last for about a week. Uh -huh. But it, it really can last for quite a bit longer. And uh -huh. Japan has shown us how long. The